Lord Lucan was a criminal psychopath whose actions produced one of the great scandals of the 20th century. Lucky Lucan was unlucky in love, unlucky in marriage, and ultimately, we should simply regard him for what he was, which is a murderer. This is a case with a forgotten victim, a children's nanny, Sandra Rivet, brutally battered to death. Sandra Rivet was very, very unlucky. She was just in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it cost her her life. On the 7th of November, 1974, an hysterical and blood-stained woman ran into the bar of the Plumber's Arms public house here at Belgravia in London, claiming her husband had killed the nanny. But this was no ordinary murder. The woman was Lady Veronica Bingham, her husband, Lord Richard John Bingham, the 7th Earl of Lucan. Over 38 years later, are we any closer to knowing the truth behind this mysterious case or the whereabouts of one of the most famous murder suspects in history, Lord Lucan? I'm Fred Dinage, and I'm investigating the murders that shocked Britain throughout the 20th century. I want to know what motivates someone to kill and find out how they think they can get away with it. Murder knows no class. Everyone from the highest aristocrats to the poor and homeless commit brutal atrocities. Lord Richard John Bingham was born into a family of great nobility. The Earl of Lucan title had been handed down for over 300 years and through nine generations. However, this Lord became one of the most controversial members of the 20th century aristocracy. When it comes to crime, the reality of what actually happened can often be replaced by myth. One man who's been trying to discover the real story behind the Earl of Lucan is the writer and author James Ruddock. Richard Bingham's early childhood, tell us a bit about that. I think it was an extremely unconventional childhood. He was born in 1934, went to prep school and uh, was raised by, by a nanny. I think the parents were quite remote. But of course the war intervened and he was sent to America. And I think it was a period of tremendous instability and I think that there was perhaps a disconnection there um, for all of the children in regard to their parents. And then at what must have been a quite um, a critical age for him to be sent halfway across the world to begin again with another family. In 1940, at the age of six, Lord Bingham was evacuated from London with his younger brother Hugh and their two sisters, Frances and Sarah. The children spent the war in luxury, staying with an heiress who owned homes in both New York and Florida. He was taken in by the widow of a millionaire banker and, and had the high life. And I think it was a suggestion that that contrasted very strongly with his life in England, in wartime England, with the rationing and so forth, and instilled in him this love of the high life that stayed with him for the rest of his life. Upon his return from America in 1945, the 11-year-old Lord Bingham struggled with the adjustment and suffered problems emotionally. I think he was probably always uh, quite a strange young man, actually. We know that his mother decided he needed to see a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist diagnosed him as having an attachment disorder and suggested that he uh, was given a dog to look after. I think that what uh, the mother probably saw was a very early stage psychopathy in him. Bingham's preordained education began at a prep school in Oxford. He then followed in the footsteps of his predecessors and attended the prestigious Eton College. It was here that the young Lord developed his rebellious ways. Lord Bingham was every inch the playboy aristocrat, preferring the gaming tables and fast cars to hard work. He was very much a man's man with strong chauvinistic views. 
Leading criminologist Professor David Wilson has studied the effects social class can have on the way we behave. Even at Eton in the final year, he was threatened with expulsion because he was gambling so much late at night with other Etonians. He would also skive off lessons. He would disappear, going off to Ascot, putting bets on horses. So already we're building up a picture from the school days of Richard Bingham loving gambling, not particularly interested in hard work. And indeed, a letter survives from this period that Bingham writes to his uncle saying that people who say that money can't buy you happiness are either stupid or speaking as a result of sour grapes. So we've got almost a caricature developing here of this upper class aristocrat who's got very reactionary views, especially in relation to women, who spends all of his life gambling, driving fast cars. In 1953, Lord Bingham's National Service papers arrived. His social standing benefited him, and the 19-year-old headed straight for the elite Coldstream Guards. He wasn't a serious soldier. I mean, he came from um, a fairly distinguished line of soldiers. The great-great-great-grandfather had fought at Balaclava and had actually ordered the charge of the Light Brigade. And um, several of his male ancestors had been awarded medals for bravery in various wars, including the First World War. But he showed no inclination as a soldier. I don't think, to be honest, he ever had the discipline for soldiering. When Bingham is in Germany, he finds opportunities to go to the Swiss Alps. He skis, he bobsleighs, he has a wonderful time. But he's best known because of these army days for gambling. He still plays poker. He's known as the best bridge player in the regiment. So again, we're getting this picture of somebody who's privileged and somebody who's not going to particularly settle down. It was during his national service that Bingham met William Shand Kidd. Shand Kidd would become a good friend and one who would feature throughout his life. The friendship with Shan Kidd was based on Shan Kidd being able to underwrite some of his more spectacular losses. Because even as a young man, you know, he was gambling huge amounts of money. And so he would try to collect rich friends who could bail him out. And that's what Shan Kidd did time after time. When Lord Bingham returned, he secured employment with a merchant bank, Brandt. But he continued with his gambling, and he soon discovered he could often earn more than his annual salary with the roll of the dice. It seemed he'd got the perfect bachelor lifestyle. A regular job bored him, um, and I, I think he probably thought to himself, why should I? And he lacked the self-discipline for that. There wasn't the money-making opportunities, um, it, it, or at least the money had to be earned legitimately and had to be earned through hard work, and he wasn't prepared to do that. He's enjoying all the benefits of bachelordom. He's got a full social diary. Women are interested in him. He's driving a soft top Aston Martin. Life couldn't really get any better for him. Lord Bingham earned himself the nickname Lucky Lucan thanks to one remarkable gambling event. In a game that lasted over two days, the Lucky Lord won £20,000. Now, that's the equivalent of £200,000 in today's money. He soon quit his job at Brandt, telling a friend, why should I toil in the city when I can win ten times my annual salary in one game? A lady whose husband ran one of the London casinos and was part of the social scene at that time is Brenda Fenton. Give me an idea of life in the 60s and 70s. It was just like James Bond. I mean, have you seen Casino Royal? Well, <laughs> it was like that. Um, people were very dressy and, and wore jewellery. There were, there were a lot of um, industries on the side, like the jewels would come in with their wares, and, and if somebody made a lot of money, they would buy the girlfriend a bit of jewellery or something, or they'd make sure that she went to see them the next day, and that's the days of the, um, the big jewellers in Monte Carlo and... Um, it's a the, different world. It was a very different world. Well, I, I suppose that world is still there, but it's not so elegant anymore. I mean, in, in Monte Carlo Casino, you can pay a fiver and you can go in in a T-shirt and jeans, whereas everyone had to be in evening dress to, um, 
go into the casinos in those days. In 1962, John Aspinall opened the Claremont Club in Berkeley Square. The club quickly became a second home to Lord Bingham, along with the social elite and like-minded wealthy gamblers. They soon became known as the Lucan set. Was Lord Lucan, I mean, was he a well-known figure? He was very tall, dark and handsome, with a moustache and a military bearing, and, and um, he was noticeable. Wherever he went, if people knew who he was, they would sort of you know, notice him, because he would walk in and... Uh, a presence. He was quite a presence. In 1957, Veronica Duncan, a pretty blonde 18-year-old, moved to London to pursue a career in modelling. She'd been an anxious and competitive child and was determined to make a decent life for herself. She was born and brought up originally in Bournemouth, but spent a lot of her time in South Africa for her childhood. Now, it's also clear that Veronica Duncan had quite a nervous personality, was quite competitive and so forth. But I think what we've got to see in Veronica Duncan, somebody who was trying to settle down. Veronica moved in with her sister, Christina. The attractive and vibrant pair soon caught the eyes of the wealthy set. In January 1963, Christina met and married Bingham's good friend, William Shan Kidd, sealing her place among the rich. Only 10 months later, it was the turn of her sister, Veronica. On the 28th of November 1963, Lord Bingham married Veronica Duncan at Holy Trinity Church in London. It was a whirlwind romance, but would it tame the wild bachelor and his reckless ways. I'm Fred Dynage, and I'm investigating the case of aristocrat Lord Richard Bingham and the shroud of mystery and murder that has enveloped the Lucan dynasty. Lord Richard Bingham had been the classic bachelor, enjoying dangerous sports and gambling. However, in 1963, at the age of 28, he met and married Veronica Duncan. I think he married her because he wanted an heir, um, and I think he thought that he'd got a woman who would be compliant with his will. People say that she was very quiet around him, slightly in awe of him, and I think he liked that, and I think he expected her to sort of know her place and that he would carry on leading his playboy lifestyle and she would stay at home and raise the children. On the 21st of January 1964, Lord Bingham's father died at the family home in Belgravia at the age of 65. With the death of the sixth Earl of Lucan, he inherits a great deal of money and of course he inherits all the class privilege that the title Earl is going to bring. The interesting thing, of course, there are still some pressures on Lucan at this particular point because he's got to produce an heir. So quite clearly, he needs to get uh, Veronica pregnant as quickly as possible. But the photographs from the time when they're together, Fred, they're almost scowling out of the photographs. They genuinely do not seem happy in each other's company. They look attractive, they look glamorous, but my gosh, do they sometimes look as if they hate each other? The couple had three children over the next six years, Francis, George and Camilla. Surprisingly, Lucan had allowed Veronica to become a part of his gambling career, and it was from then on that cracks in their relationship began to show. Former crime journalist Bob Strange later on became embroiled in the Lucan story. As time went on, Veronica began to assert her own independence a little more and began to not be completely content to be sitting at home while he was out gambling and began to get worried about the state of the family finances and, and the finances that would care for her children and his, his children in the years to come. And, of course, she would watch him gambling sometimes at the, was it the Claremont Club. Yes, they had their seat, which was called the widow's bench, if I remember rightly. Um, and she and other wives would, would 
sit there and, and chit chat while their husbands were, were busy gambling sometimes through into the early hours of the morning. Um, Lady Lucan has said since that she didn't mind that, that she that, that was quite a pleasant way for her to spend her evenings. But all of Lucan's friends at the time recall it being a, a more and more of a source of friction. She was not of the same class of, as Lord Lucan, didn't have quite the same aristocratic background as Lord Lucan. And we're talking now about a time that, that when that really did matter. The whole marriage was characterised by Lord Lucan thinking, I am an aristocrat, I have this deep, deep family background. Veronica probably is not quite up to my standing in life and she should be grateful that she's married to me and I should be able to do whatever I want. Lord and Lady Lucan seemed to the outside world to be a rich and handsome couple. But behind closed doors, it was a different story. Veronica was a much more complicated person than he'd realized. Veronica had had her own psychiatric problems when she was a child. She'd been bullied at school. She was a highly strung child. As a teenager, she was diagnosed as bipolar. So she had um, problems. And she recognized that the lifestyle that he was addicted to as a gambler was going to produce ruin. But once you've got three children, you've got responsibilities towards them. She found it increasingly intolerable that he would go off of an evening and blow 10 grand um, and have to go round his friends with a begging bowl to make up for it, and then go out a week later and do exactly the same. An impossible way of life for her. She was being prescribed medication for anxiety and for depression. And of course, she is diagnosed during this period as being a manic depressive. Now that also will put pressure on the marriage. Indeed, there's often occasions documented where Lord Lucan would encourage his wife to go in the car for a drive in the country, and he would try and have her committed. In January 1973, the marriage came to an end. Lord Lucan moved out of the family home into a five-bedroom apartment just around the corner. The split soon turned sour, and Lucan began to develop feelings of hatred towards his estranged wife. It was a separation that would have deadly consequences. The custody battle began on the 11th of June 1973 for the Lucan children, Francis, George and Camilla. Veronica came into her own once they separated. And you see a very different person from this meek young lady who had not had much to say and who had basically followed orders. And you suddenly see this uh, very spirited person who's prepared to fight for her rights and the rights of her children. There was one incident which happened which really ended any possibility of a relationship between them and made Lucan most bitter of all and I, I think was the one trigger that led him to take drastic action. Lady Lucan suddenly sprung on him and on the hearing some stories of uh, sexual misdemeanours that Lord Lucan had perpetrated during the course of their marriage. and. He felt this was the ultimate betrayal. He had some sexual tastes which were, at the time, slightly unusual. He encouraged her to exercise in a rubber exercise suit that he bought her before bedtime each night. And he kept a little cane in the wardrobe of their bedroom. And Lady Lucan had very carefully documented these instances of, of slight unusual behaviour. And that was the one thing that he never could forgive her for that, that what he regarded as a, as a deep personal betrayal. He absolutely did think he was going to win the custody battle, even though there was a presumption at that time within the courts that custody should go to the mother and not to the father. But Lucan spared no expense. He hired the best barrister in the country. The custody hearing itself lasted for a number of days. But even at the end of that, um, and it was going to cost, because remember, he was also paying for Veronica's court fees as well. At the end, the hit Lucan's barrister throws in the towel, custody goes to Veronica, and Lucan is left with a bill of at least £40,000, which is a substantial amount of money in the 1970s. The children were officially handed to Lady Lucan, 
but it was the court stipulation that she must employ a suitable nanny to help her. In September 1974, Lady Lucan employed a new nanny for her children. Sandra Rivet was a vivacious redhead, a hairdresser from a working-class background with no nanny qualifications to speak of. Sandra was just a really pleasant, sweet girl um, who'd come from an ordinary working family. Um, and um, she'd done various jobs. She'd been a hairdresser and so forth. But um, she loved children, and um, she decided that she wanted to be a nanny. From looking after children nearby in Belgravia, she got to know Lady Lucan. Unfortunately, Sandra Rivett's job as the Lucan nanny lasted only two months. Everything changed on the evening of the 7th of November, 1974, at around 9 o'clock. It was customary for Lady Lucan to make a cup of tea at that time of the night, but on this occasion, the nanny, Sandra Rivet, had offered to do it. She went downstairs to the basement kitchen, carrying the tray of crockery. It's about quarter to nine at night. Uh, Sandra Rivet goes down the few flights of uh, stairs to go to where she can make a cup of tea. She tries to switch on the light into the kitchen, but can't do so because someone has removed the bulb that would light up the kitchen. As she switches, tries to switch on the light, Sandra is attacked, viciously attacked, uh, about the head by an assailant, and there are a number of blows to her head which eventually are going to kill her. Lady Lucan went in search of her. As she walked down the steps to the basement, she was struck down by a mysterious figure in the dark. I'm Fred Dynage, and I'm following the horrific events of the 7th of November, 1974, and the mystery surrounding the murder of Sandra Rivet. Was Lord Lucan to blame for this atrocity? Lord and Lady Lucan had had a tempestuous relationship and divorced in July 1974. Their three children were placed in the custody of their mother, much to the frustration and anger of their father. Just four months later, the Lucan household had become the scene of a brutal murder. The children's nanny, Sandra Rivet, had been killed and placed in a US mailbag. Meanwhile, Lady Lucan, mystified by the nanny's disappearance and unaware of the macabre scene, headed towards the basement. And what she said to me when I interviewed her was that she called Sandra, Sandra twice. And then this figure came at her in the dark and she was bashed on the, at the front, here, the front of the head, uh, with an upside down V, two severe blows. Now, these were the kind of blows that were so severe they'd killed Sandra. Um, but they didn't kill Veronica. The murder weapon, a piece of lead piping, was ineffective and bent from the blows to Sandra. The assailant dropped it and put his hand around Lady Lucan's neck and began to strangle her. From Lady Lucan's account of events, crime writer Linda Stratman believes she knows what happened next. Someone tried to throttle her, they tried to gouge her eye out, they pushed gloved fingers down her throat to stop her from screaming, and she just fought for her life. She grabbed hold of the man's testicles and squeezed them, and this shocked him, and they just fell into a heap on the floor. And then she realised who it was. It was her husband. With Sandra Rivet dead and Lady Lucan injured, the alleged attacker, Lucan, had to think fast. How was he going to get out of this dilemma? She played for time. I think this was very courageous. Um, he clearly hadn't decided what he was going to do next. She asked where Sandra was. He admitted that he'd killed her. Now, Sandra shouldn't have been there that evening. It was intended to be her night off, and Lord Lucan knew that it was her night off. But she changed her day that week, and so she was there. So the assumption then is he was waiting for his wife to come down to make, to make the tea. Yes. He was going to kill her. Uh, it was very dark. The other woman, Sandra Rivet, came down and he accidentally, if you like, made her his victim. 
Yes, because she was, uh, first of all, as I've you've just said, it was dark and also she was the same height and not very far different in build. And of course, he simply wasn't expecting her to be there. Normally, it would have been his wife coming down the stairs to make the tea. So, of course, he, uh, in the dark, saw what he expected to see and attacked the woman. According to Lady Lucan, her husband then helped her upstairs and asked her if she'd be willing to take an overdose of her sleeping tablets. She lay down on the bed. The eldest daughter saw them there at the time. That's another important witness to the fact that Lord Lucan was there that night, but they sent her back to her bedroom. She wanted to bathe the wounds on her head. He went into the bathroom. While the taps were running, she crept as quickly and quietly as she could out of the house, rushed out into the nearest public house, and then that was when she gave the alarm. The locals at the Plumber's Arms had been enjoying a night out when suddenly a lady burst in with blood running down her head, yelling murder. Sergeant Don Baker of the Metropolitan Police was the first on the scene. At that time, I was a serving police officer. I was a uniform sergeant at Gerald Road Police Station, which covers Belgravia. With a PC, I went to the Plumber's Arms. On entry, I saw a lady, who I now know to be Lady Lucan, lying on a bench just inside the front door. She was ranting and raving, and I calmed her down and spoke to her, and I said, how did you obtain these injuries? There were several scalp wounds, and the blood was running down her forehead. And she said, my husband did it. And as she left the premises, she turned around and in a very casual way said, oh, and he's killed the maid. A bit of a shock at the time. The police followed the blood trail back to Lady Lucan's home and discovered a house of horror. The murder scene displayed blood on every wall, and in the kitchen doorway, police discovered a mailbag. Sticking out of it, a pale white arm. There was a lot of areas that were covered in blood, but we didn't see anybody at all in the rooms. I said to the PC that with the amount of blood we've seen and the story we've heard, we should be able to find a body in this place. At the time, I put my foot on a bag. It was a US mail sack. And as I did so, a girl I now know to be Sandra Rivet, her arm came out with a wristwatch on. I realised that she was dead from the, the, the temperature of her arm, there was no movement, there was no chance of her being alive. I did not open the bag any further. The blows to Sandra Rivet and Lady Lucan had covered the Belgravia residence in blood. The blood patterns revealed the horrific sequence of the attacks. Did the blood types match? Yes, of course, there was no DNA in those days, but, in fact, Lady Lucan was, was blood type A and Sandra was blood type B. The first attack site that they came to, the one at the top of the stairs where Lady Lucan said she had been attacked, that was all type A blood. In the basement, the vast majority of the blood there was type B. The blood types found in the Belgravia house supported Lady Lucan's version of events and therefore pointed the finger at her husband, Lord Lucan. An arrest warrant was immediately issued for Lord Lucan and surveillance ordered on all airports and harbours. But unbeknown to the police, Lucan was driving down the A27 to Uckfield in Sussex and the home of fellow gambler Ian Maxwell Scott. Immediately on leaving the house, Lucan was obviously in a state of shock. Uh, he ran around the corner to a phone box. Um, he phoned up the mother of a friend of, of Francis, his daughter, uh, with, the, uh, uh, with the idea of asking her to go round to the house because he didn't want the children to come downstairs and find the body in the basement. But he wasn't able to, to raise this lady on the phone, so he then phoned his mother. And she said that he was incoherent with shock and that he mumbled a, a garbled story about an attack at the house and could she come round as soon as possible to look after the children. He then got in his car 
and drove down to uh, Uckfield in Sussex. Lord Lucan had borrowed a friend's car. His own car worked perfectly well and he could have used it, but he wanted to transport a dead body in the boot. And he very wisely decided that he was going to do that with a car that didn't belong to him, so that if there was any suspicion, there wouldn't be any forensic traces that the police could find. Ian Maxwell Scott wasn't home that night, and his wife Susan let in the distraught Lord Lucan. Strangely, his version of events echoed a familiar story watched by most of the country. It was actually the plot of a very famous television series at the time, The Fugitive, that had been long running. And the plot of The Fugitive was that a man comes home to his house and finds his wife being attacked by a, a killer, and that the killer escapes, and the husband then gets accused of being the killer. Lord Lucan told Susan Maxwell Scott he'd been driving past the house when he saw Lady Lucan and a man fighting in the basement. He'd rushed in to help, and the man quickly fled. His wife then accused him of hiring someone to kill her while pointing to a sack in the corner. Lord Lucan's version of events were quickly dismissed by the police. I don't think that any of the office, senior officers involved believed for one moment that that could have been the case. And they did tests of the sight lines from outside on the pavement into the house. And in effect, Lucan would have to have been laying flat on the floor of the pavement to have noticed such a thing happening. Lord Lucan stayed with Susan Maxwell Scott in Uckfield for over two hours, putting his personal and financial affairs into order. She tried to uh, encourage him to stay for the night, which he refuses to do, but he instead writes uh, two letters to Bill Shan Kidd, his brother-in-law, one saying that, you know, he's completely innocent, but Veronica will blame him, and another letter outlining to Bill Shan Kidd the kinds of family possessions that could be sold at Christie's to pay off some of his debts. Lord Lucan also called his mother, who'd collected the children. She was now accompanied by a policeman, and when she asked if he'd like to speak to him, Lucan simply replied, no, not now, I'll ring them in the morning, and hung up. So the police waited. The police said that they thought that he would walk into the police station at Gerald Road in Belgravia with a prepared statement and a solicitor that morning, and that he would have his story straight, and the last thing that they expected was, was for him to disappear. On the 8th of November, 1974, just five hours after the murder of Sandra Rivett, Lucan left the Maxwell Scott house and disappeared into the night. It would be the last time the 7th Earl of Lucan would ever be seen, officially. I'm Fred Dynage, and I'm re-examining the events that led to the mysterious disappearance of Lord Lucan and the brutal murder of his children's nanny, Sandra Rivett. On the 7th of November, 1974, Sandra Rivett's body was found concealed in a mailbag in the basement of the Lucan household. Lady Lucan had named her husband as the killer, but he was nowhere to be found. Three days later, the police discovered the blue Ford Corsair that Lord Lucan had borrowed from a friend a couple of weeks before the incident. It had been abandoned at New Haven in East Sussex. When the borrowed car was found, there was considerable trace evidence linking it to the crime scene. There was type A and type B blood found. Um, there were some fibres of clothing found in the car that were also found in the house. And in addition to that, there was a, a leaf torn from a notebook which matched up with a note that Lord Lucan later on wrote to the friend who had lent him the car. And in the boot of the car, there was a piece of lead piping that was more or less identical to the lead piping that had been found at Lower Belgrave Street that had been used to kill Sandra and attack Lady Lucan. But of Lucan, there was no sign. Lucan had vanished into thin air, and the million-dollar question still remains today. Where did he go? Since the 1970s, hundreds of conspiracy theories have been put forward. Did he commit suicide? 
was this actually the work of a hired hitman? Or was he killed and eaten by John Aspinall's tigers? Why are we so obsessed with an alternative version of events? Tell me about conspiracy theories and why people feel they need them. People invest a great deal of time, can sometimes become obsessional about uh, conspiracy theories, and they seem to put themselves into the theory. And so what's interesting to me is what this reveals about the person who believes these conspiracy theories. Sometimes they can have hopes and aspirations, which they're projecting onto the event around which they build a conspiracy theory. Take, for example, the issue of Princess Diana dying in the car accident in the tunnel. You know, you and I know that was caused because the chauffeur was drunk. The chauffeur was above the alcohol legal limit to drive. But that's not what people think. Let's have a look and see what some of the public thought about the death of Diana. I think there's something strange about Diana's death. Um, I think uh, there's much more to it than meets the eye. It's got to be the British government. 99% sure of that. Would they want uh, a baby from an Egyptian, Egyptian family being born? You know, it's a, a elf fired son getting her pregnant and effectively they know in full well that's going to be brought into the uh, aristocracy and affect part of the, you know, the royal British family. Don't know, probably just hounded to death um, by the paparazzi. Um, it's so difficult to tell. So what does that tell you then? For me, it's sometimes about People believing that government is a far more shadowy and sinister presence than we would believe. Some people believe that government can be quite malevolent and therefore they project onto the, a particular story like Diana the hand of secret security services wanting Diana dead for particular reasons. Watch this. Yeah, I think the government are covering up the possibilities of UFOs. I mean, this whole universe, we can't be the only intelligent life form planet, or so-called intelligent life form planet, in the whole universe, it just doesn't add up. I, I think the government definitely are covering up UFO activity. There's definitely something out there. I think as long as the conspiracy theory doesn't get taken to extremes, they're relatively harmless. But here's the problem in relation to our story about Lord Lucan. That conspiracy theory about what happened on the night of the murder and then subsequently what happened to Lucan himself, that conspiracy theory masks the reality of somebody dying. And the person who died is never remembered in this story, and that's the nanny, Sandra Rivett. But even in relation to Lucan, Let's have a listen to what some of the people that we interviewed thought about him. I think Lord Lucan killed the nanny, faked his own death, and he's still around walking about. Yes, I think Lord Lucan probably did kill the nanny, and that's why he disappeared afterwards. And with plastic surgery, I think it's very possible that he's still alive somewhere. It's a strange thought um, that, you know, there may be hundreds of people in the world um, you know, evading justice and being somebody who, who, the, who they're not really. And so they want to think of him sunning himself on the island of Goa or living in South Africa or in Brazil, having had plastic surgery to change his face. It's a way of cocking a snook at government, at law and order, at the police force who were trying to bring him to justice. So ultimately, perhaps with conspiracy theories, we're given a little window into our culture, into what it wants, what it believes, what it hopes for. The police followed reports and sightings of the missing Lord Lucan all over the world, but to no avail. Finally, an inquest was held to discover the cause and circumstances of Sandra Rivett's death. Although with no suspect, there could be no trial. The inquest into Sandra Rivett's murder began on Monday the 16th of June 1975 at Westminster Coroner's Court, seven months after she was killed. We've always had a fascination with the upper classes and the Lucan case was no exception, particularly as the presumed guilty party was still on the run. What about the inquest? What was the atmosphere like there? There was two sides of it. There was the in-court atmosphere, 
and there was the out-of-court atmosphere. The in-court atmosphere was a split between fact and fiction and the gentry. It wasn't any, so much an inquest on Sandra Rivet that came over as a trial of Lord Lucan. But the coroner got a verdict from the jury in the end. Outside, there were many, many reporters and media there. The atmosphere was jovial. And when the jury went out, they even run a sweepstake on how long they would be out. And Sandra Rivett's family, unsurprisingly, very bitter and very upset. It's a devastating thing for Sandra Rivett's family. I think their grief and pain was compounded by the fact that the attention of the media was all on Lucan and so forth. I think they felt that Sandra, who was completely innocent in every regard, um, ha had been forgotten. I think that was extremely difficult for them. The inquest lasted for four days. The missing Lord's family, his friends, the Lucan set, and the press were desperate to finally hear what had actually happened. The coroner described the motive for these attacks as a matter of conjecture. The inquest was uh, a real oddity in English law. It was the last time that a, a coroner's jury were allowed to bring in a verdict naming a murderer. They named Lord Luke and, as the killer of Sandra Rivet. And that must have been of some comfort to Sandra Rivet's family that actually they had a conclusion of sorts. But of course, the main participant in the entire event, Lord Lucan himself, was not there. Nobody knew where he was. It was pretty obvious by that time that he had made a completely clean getaway. Lord Lucan was named as the murderer in the inquest of Sandra Rivet. However, he has never been formally convicted. In October 1999, Lord Lucan was declared officially dead by Britain's High Court. His estate, valued at just £15,000, was released to his executors. But his son, Lord George Bingham, is unable to take his father's seat in the House of Lords or inherit the title of the 8th Earl of Lucan until there is actual proof that Lord Lucan is dead. I've got two theories. He had a friend who had an estate in Mexico and Lord Lucan could almost certainly have set out life there. And my other favourite, favourite place and the place that I know Roy Ranson, the policeman involved, always thought was a possibility is Botswana along the Limpopo River called the Thule Block where every estate is... A, is colonially owned, and Lord Lucan could have dropped into that sort of community. Um, and if people didn't ask too many questions, th that would have been a good home for him. I don't think we'll ever know what happened to Lucan. I th my own view is that he arrived in New Haven. It was a ferry due to leave at 7 that morning. And it's a very short walk, I've done it myself, from Norman Street, where he parked the car, to the harbour. Um, there were two fishermen uh, who were getting ready to set sail that morning at about six o'clock. They saw someone who they later identified as Lucan. Now, I'm of the view that he stowed on board one of the ferries that was leaving New Haven, um, and I think about halfway across, he jumped off and probably got caught up in the screws. And uh, that, that, that was the end of him. What, what could have happened to Lord Lucan, do you think? I mean, do you think he... Do you think he did commit suicide? Do you think he did that? <laughs> I think he made a big mistake by killing the wrong woman. <laughs> but um, what? I don't think he committed suicide. I think they were too arrogant, you know. They would think that it would have been fun to escape. <laughs> I dearly would like to know the answer to an awful lot of questions that Lord Lucan left behind him. And uh, one day, I hope he comes back to be prosecuted or not, but just to fill in a few of the blanks in this very fascinating story. Lord Lucan left behind a scene of blood and mayhem and disappeared without a trace. There have been many reported sightings of him around the world over the past 35 years that have remained just that. Did he murder the nanny? Did he escape? Did he commit suicide? The true story of what really happened may never, ever be known. <laughs>